scripture is from Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 11. It won't surprise you to see a minister using this text on Father's Day, but I'm hoping that perhaps I can give you, help you look at it in a way you might not have before. So, reading now. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. May God bless to us this reading from his sacred word. Because today is Father's Day, I decided to speak about the Christian understanding of fatherhood. Put succinctly, the Christian ideal is that a father is God's surrogate. As our Heavenly Father is to us, so a father should be to his children. Jesus addressed God as Father and taught his disciples to pray, Our Father. With Christians, these two concepts, godliness and fatherhood, are inseparable. If we don't relate to God as Jesus did, and if we don't think of him as Jesus did, we will not raise our sons to be the kind of father Jesus wanted them to be. The passage we read this morning from Hebrews comes immediately after that unforgettable image of an Olympic race, an Olympian race, where the runners are, are coming down to the finish line. And the author says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. 
the writer moves from that image immediately to the subject of discipline. Specifically, the regimen of training required to condition oneself to win. And he puts both human fathers and our Heavenly Father in the role of athletic trainer, you might say. And so he writes, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate. We all have had, had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. <coughs> How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? To persons raised in the Christian faith, comparisons between God and human fathers are unremarkable. But when Jesus spoke on the subject of fatherhood, his reworking of that subject was truly shocking. To understand how radical his ideas were, we need to understand the power and authority which fathers had in the first century. In the Roman world, the father had absolute legal control over his family. He could discipline his children in whatever manner he chose. He had the power to choose their spouses or to dissolve their marriages. The father controlled the family finances, even the finances of his children. The philosopher Epictetus, who founded the Stoic school of philosophy, wrote, to be a son is to regard all one's possessions as property of the father. To obey the Father in all things, never to blame him before anyone, to support him with all one's power. The Father's absolute legal authority was supported by his priestly role. He alone was allowed to handle the family gods and to lead family devotions. Plato and most other Greek philosophers regarded the father as the living image of the gods. In ancient times, Jewish society was comprised of extended families ruled by patriarchs. And even in the time of Jesus, sons, their wives, and their children were all part of what was called the Father's house. All family property belonged to the Father, even property earned or acquired by his children. When a girl married into the family, the dowry she brought with her became the property of her father-in-law. In Jewish homes, as with the pagans, it was the Father who led the devotions. In a few rare instances in ancient Israel, priests and prophets were called father. And that's because of the unquestioning respect and obedience which people owed to them. But the, never, the Jews never called God father until very late in their history. Historians think this is because they wanted to distinguish their god from the pagan deities. When pagans spoke of a god as father, they meant it literally. They meant that they believed they were physically descended from the god they worshipped. The Jews did not believe that they were offspring of God. They were his creations, not his children in that sense.
Sometimes in, in, in Jesus' time, there were some people who referred to God as Father, but like I said, it was rare. And if they did speak to God <coughs> as Father, it was in terms of that absolute authority and the unquestioning debt of obedience which children owed. But with this parable, Jesus, Jesus introduced a radically new idea. From the opening of the story, this father is a remarkable person. <coughs> to begin with, he lets his younger son have what he wants. No father in first century Judea would have done that. When Jesus, with the very first sent second sentence of the parable, Jesus shocks his listeners. They're all thinking, what? He demanded his property, his half of the inheritance before his father's death? That's the same as wishing his father to be dead. A father would have thrown him out of the house. <coughs> if the villagers heard <coughs> what he had demanded, <coughs> they would have thrown him out of the village. <coughs> Such an impudent son would, would, be, would be shunned by everyone. But what shocks the audience next is that Jesus goes on to say the father gave him what he want, wanted. He divided the property. No father would do that. And so the audience listening to this parable are thinking, what? He gave him half of the estate? Now we need to understand that in a, a rural culture, <coughs> the family wealth is in land and livestock. To give the boy half of his inheritance meant selling off half of the land and half of the livestock. That not only meant cutting the family's net worth in half, <coughs> but it meant that the father and his remaining son would have to work much harder to make a living with what they had left. There would be less land to cultivate and to graze cattle upon, less forage. There would be fewer cattle to work with, to breed. So by giving this boy half of the land, half of the livestock, and it was sold off, no doubt, he has brought hardship on himself and his older son. You can see why the older son was resentful. Um, the father was under no obligation to do this and no other father in the world would have done it. In fact, honor demanded that he should be punished. So why did he do it? Why did he do something that no father in the audience, as Jesus told this parable, would even dream of doing? Perhaps it was like this, for things to come to such a head. The relationship between the father and his younger son must have been going bad for a long time. The boy wanted out of the family. What good was there in keeping him there against his will? The father didn't need another farmhand. He could hire one. He wanted a son. He wanted someone who would love him and respect him and someday inherit the land and, and keep, it go keep, it, keep it going. 
the son didn't want to be there, if the son didn't love his father, why force him to stay? And so, in a shocking act of prodigality, the father sells off half of the property and gives the proceeds to the boy and lets him go. Tradition has always called this the parable of the prodigal son, but it's really the parable of the prodigal father. The father is the real prodigal in this story. So now let's fast forward to the end of the story. The father is looking down the road. Many preachers suggest that he was looking down that road for a long time, wishing that someday he would see the boy returning. We don't know if that's true. But when he sees the boy's bedraggled, sorry figure limping up the road, he does another thing that the audience would find shocking. But before we look at what the father does, consider when his heart is moved and he wants to go out to the boy, he doesn't know if the boy has changed. He doesn't know if he's had a change of heart. And in fact, in the story, Jesus says that in fact, the boy was still self-absorbed when he made the decision to go home. He didn't go home because he missed his father, because he wanted to be with his father. He went home because he was hungry. <coughs> and he realized that he could eat if he went to work for his father. The speech he gave about sinning against God and sinning before his father, notice he doesn't say sinning, he was sinning against his father. Um, it, it's simply to lead up to his request that the father would take him on as a hired hand. So at least when he starts down that road, he is thinking still about himself. He's looking out for himself. Now, at least this much has changed. At least he has come to recognize how well his father treats his workers. At least he gives his father credit for that. The father, his father's workers are well fed. So he's learned something. So what does the father do? He runs. Dr. Ken, Kenneth Bailey is a professor of medieval uh, culture and, and Bible. He's taught in several seminaries and is presently retired. But he lived in Lebanon for many years and spent much time in the traditional villages and learned a lot about village culture. And from his experiences living among the villagers in Lebanon, he approaches this parable in a way that 